some of the funding goes to individuals and some of it goes to companies, right? Go to arts organizations. So typically, what is, what is the kind of relationship you expect to have with the artist or the company? A creative fellow um, is funded actually to be creative. Um, and so the whole point of that is not to spend endless hours um, filling out acquittals to the, to the foundation that supported them to do exactly that. Uh, in the context of public funding being available in those roles, there are, there's simply the need because public funding brings with it other responsibilities that there are acquittals and there are, there are different um, levels of feedback that are required. So um, it's one of the reasons why I'm actually excited about um, opportunities for philanthropy to extend its presence um, uh, in, other, in other places because I think many, many of you will find that um, uh, there's a creative process of working with philanthropic trusts that, that's actually very different and the nature of the responses and the relationships that you, that you have with uh, philanthropic trusts is quite different. Earlier on you had, you had talked about the difference between uh, sponsorship and, and, and philanthropy and uh, we, we said sponsorship, you think about a transaction, you think about a deal and I think in Singapore, quite often, we are perhaps framing fundraising in that way. Uh, and uh, you had then said that philanthropy, you had the analogy you used was a gift. Um, can, I, can I invite you to expand on those yeah. thoughts? Well, yeah. well look, I, I'd be pleased to do that. I, I think very often um, there's a sense that private sector support is everything that government doesn't, doesn't do. Uh, and it's thought that there's one, one bucket that is somehow companies and corporates. Um, um, I mean, I'd, I'd really encourage a, an examination of the nuances and differences that exist uh, uh, within you know, what is called private sector support. Um, so what a company is interested in, um, where there are customers and clients and there's brand and there are a whole lot of other considerations around creating an adjacency uh, and a partnership and a relationship with an arts organisation, that's an entirely different proposition to a private philanthropic trust that actually isn't selling a, a product or, or a brand in particular. Uh, it actually, in many instances, will have a corpus of uh, funding available to support those organisations um, and individuals that are consistent with the strategy that they uh, uh, develop. Um, and in fact, um, the philanthropic trust exists to make grants. I mean, that's, that's what the corpus is for. Uh, it can't be used for any other purpose. So, so it is a great place to develop a relationship. So, so the deal very often, and I'm sure I'm not telling you anything that, that you don't already know in this space, you know, is very often you know, a corporate wanting to know the size of the banner that's going to appear, the number of mentions they might have, um, the manner in which they will be acknowledged on an opening night, um, the opportunity that exists to create an adjacency between what might be a product or service and what you're, and what you're doing. And you'll sit down and there'll be a, a sponsorship contract and all of those things will be itemised and there'll be a, uh, an amount of money that's, uh, uh, that's agreed between you as to, um, uh, as to how much you're able to um, uh, accept to do all of those things. Um, and hopefully uh, you'll leave enough wriggle room in there that there's some decent money to help you actually do what you really want to do, which is run the organisations or, or manage the project that your organisation is doing. For, philanthropy is generally a very different conversation. Um, it's not transactional. Um, uh, I mean, a good philanthropic relationship and a relationship with a benefactor is something that might go on for years and years and years and years. Um, uh, and certainly you should enter into a relationship with the philanthropic sector on the presumption that that's what's going to be uh, uh, the case. Um, so if there is a grant agreement, and I say if there's going to be a grant agreement because many um, uh, individual benefactors and philanthropists uh, are not quite so formal uh, as some of the sponsorships ship arrangements are, but broadly speaking, you know, they'll probably want an annual acquittal um, on what you've done with the funds and they'll want to know something about the outcomes. And some of the philanthropic trusts, I'm sure, particularly the venture philanthropic trusts and those who's, who, are, who are having conversations with you about returns, return on equity and other considera considerations like that will want to know uh, quite a bit more. But broadly speaking, um, uh, the conversation is, uh, is one of uh, actually undertaking the work that's been agreed to in the submission that you, that you made uh, and to share some of, the, uh, some of the specific outcomes from those, uh, particular, th that particular project or, or the uh, particular uh, program. The point that I'd make particularly though, uh, and uh, it's one of the things that I certainly feel very keenly about, is that 
this is a relationship. It's not a, tran it's not a transaction. And very often, the individuals within the foundation um, are wanting to, in some way to follow their money. I don't mean follow their money in the sense of wanting to influence um, what you do or hang around and be pains in the neck, um, but are interested in what the organisation is, what the project is, what the opportunity is, uh, and they actually like being in discussion um, with, uh, with individual organisations and they, they like the adjacency and they, they enjoy it. Um, um, so uh, there's an expression that I know uh, I've heard Jonathan Mills um, use um, from time to time. Uh, he, uh, many of you might know he was the um, uh, festival director in, in Edinburgh and one of his expressions is giving good foyer. Um, and, and the meaning of giving good foyer uh, is that there's sort of a presence of the organisation within the foyer uh, a, a, around a performance, before a performance, interval and afterwards to, to talk about and, and share something of the, the journey of the particular project in, in the case of a performing art, arts event. Uh, so that's, um, I think that's a little bit different to the, the character of the, of the deal and transaction that you might have with, um, with sponsors. And there are obviously some, some grey areas where you've got you know, some great corporate sponsors that are a bit, a bit more gift oriented and there are some pain in the neck philanthropists that are far more deal oriented um, around what they might want and you just have to sort of judge the two. But that's, that's the general heading I think. But if, if I'm a small arts company and I just basically have one or two people looking after this, and you know, I've got to worry about so many things, right? I've got to worry about dealing with NAC, I've got to worry about dealing with MDA, I've got to worry about my volunteers, I've got to worry about my actors throwing a tantrum on stage. I've got so many things to worry about, and then now I have to worry about raising funds, right? With a very limited capacity and bandwidth, you know, in terms of trying to prioritize, right? You, you talked about sponsorship and philanthropy and the differences between the two. How would you advise me, a small arts company, to kind of map up? you know, yeah. some priorities and a kind of a road map on, on, on what do I do next? Huh? Yeah, look, it, it's a really good question and, I, and I'm very conscious that in the small to medium sector there are, there are organisations that uh, are fragile and frail and have limited resources. Um, um, what I would encourage you to consider uh, is that the fundraising process is actually part of your creative process. Um, I mean, you are all engaged in creative organisations doing creative things with creative people. Um, you know, I think it's, um, it's really beholden upon you to think of creative ways in which you can develop relationships with, uh, with prospective funders and, 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 and come up with a solution and a concept that's, uh, uh, that doesn't make it pain in the neck fundraising. Um, I mean, I do know, of course, that there's a sense that what a terrible nuisance it is that you, you have to go out and, and do this and wouldn't life be easier uh, if, um, if the funds sort of just came channeled in in a particular way. Um, but I, I'd really discourage you from, from taking that attitude. Um, those projects and programs that are most exciting uh, in the f philanthropic sector are generally those that, that come with a, with a great passion and enthusiasm from those that are most closely involved in the art form or the project for which the funding is being raised. I'm very conscious that, um, you know, that there are uh, and some organisations, professional staff involved directly in, in programming. But you know, in my experience, it's the director of the gallery, it's the artistic director, uh, it's, um, it's someone involved right at the creative, um, um, uh, 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 right at the beachhead of the organisation that actually excites um, philanthropic support. So, for example, in Melbourne, there's a fantastic um, uh, organisation called Somebody's Daughter, uh, a theatre company that works with women in prisons um, and um, uh, it's been extraordinary in the way in which um, the story of that company uh, has been shared with the philanthropic sector uh, and the way in which those, the, the actors themselves, those directly involved in artistic direction uh, have um, come and spoken with uh, uh, trustees and executive officers and individual benefactors, um, got them excited about what it means uh, in the um, philanthropic journey to not just write out a cheque, but actually um, become involved in visiting women in prisons, attending uh, organisations. Now, some of you might think that you know philanthropists are these frightfully grand people, you know, that wouldn't want to do that sort of thing. Well, well, let me tell you, it absolutely is what is at the heart of a lot of the motiv motivation and mobilisation of people's support for for what's happening in the small to medium sector. 
So um, you know, create those opportunities to, to do something um, creative with, uh, um, with those who you think would be interested in, in the program and make it part of the creative life of the organisation rather than just something that gets tacked on as a, as a have to do. Part of the point of saying that within the context of the discussion this afternoon is even though you might have completed your acquittals and uh, the formality of a, um, of, a, uh, of a relationship, either sponsorship for that matter or philanthropic, you know, try and find a way of keeping uh, those with whom you develop that relationship current and, and fresh uh, and aware of what the uh, medium to long term impact has been on, um, on, on, their, on their support. Um, it's part of this whole uh, emphasis of philanthropy not being transactional but relationship based. Um, and, and frankly, you, know, you should be planning to hold those relationships forever. Um, there's actually no, there is no reason in logic um, uh, why uh, someone who is excited by, uh, uh, by the artistic vision of, a, of an organisation within the, within the small to medium sector shouldn't remain interested and excited and really enthralled about what happens all the way along. Um, and that, that's your opportunity to keep that person. They become great advocates for the organisation and they, they bring in others and they want to do things collaboratively. So there, there really is an opportunity to, to make that happen. How can artists even kind of know where to start in terms of identifying who to have a relationship with? The community that exists around an individual um, small to medium organisation um, is very often rich with people who um, uh, have uh, 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 an interest in and sympathy to the art form and to the ideas. Um, and I, I'd have to say, you've got to start with your own board. In my experience, um, if your board isn't actually leading by example, then you know, in Australia we have an expression about lead in your saddlebag, um, uh, which you know, slows them. <laughs> lead as in heavy lead, lead, lead in, the, in, the in the saddle bag, so, so in horse riding, so in the, in the myth of Australia as an outback country, if you have lead in your saddle bags, it means the horses can't go as far. Um, so the idea of a board that doesn't contribute um, is uh, actually lead in the saddle bag. It means the organisation isn't able to reach its potential and, uh, um, and certainly if your board is not committed and involved, um, then um, that's not a great example uh, to anyone from whom you might be seeking uh, philanthropic support. Um, the amount actually doesn't matter. Um, it actually doesn't matter. And obviously some board members have greater financial capacity than others. But for anyone of apparent financial capacity who says that my contribution to the organisation is my time, then you actually have to stand up to them and say, no, that's not the answer. That's not enough. Your time is, uh, is terrific but it's your financial support by which you need to give the example to others uh, to come on this journey with us. Um, so finding those people, working through the board, knowing the community that you're serving, knowing the stakeholders, knowing your audience, knowing the context in which people you know, come to um, attend the performances or the openings or be part of the ecology of each organisation, uh, and then developing the networks uh, uh, out of those, and then um, uh, continuing to maintain those relationships. I think um, certainly from the perspective of a, of a philanthropist, you can see the ecology developing around uh, individual organisations. And very often, it, the best ecology is around those organisations that are, that are really very small and have limited professional resources at their, at their disposal to develop those sorts of relationships. So impact measurement. I think a word in fundraising and philanthropy is a lot more about how do you measure the impact. And I find that sometimes, fund, not so much funders, but uh, foundations are willing to give you for a year, but they would love to see how we're changing conversation at government levels and how we change the entire industry with a year's funding, which is tough. How does your foundation look at impact measurements and what do you expect? Everyone here would know that it is an imprecise science. Um, Incidentally, um, measuring scientific outcomes is also an imprecise science. So, so don't be fooled into thinking that there are other sectors that attract philanthropic funding that do a, a greater job than, than what happens in, in measurement of cultural outcomes. They might think they do, but the reality is that there's as much weakness in the way in which uh, other, um, uh, other outcomes get, get measured. There are the obvious um, 
um, uh, outcomes uh, relating to, to numbers and uh, um, uh, the number of performances and, and those things that can that can be measured. The economic outcomes can be can be talked about. Uh, if there are education programs involved, then uh, levels of participation. Um, uh, there are um, across a number of the other instrumentalist benefits. Um, you know, health outcomes, and there are social cohesion outcomes, and there's a lot of work that's been done recently about finding individual measurements around those things. But at the heart of all of this, and at the heart of everything that you all do, um, is uh, are, the, are the cultural outcomes, which are, of course, in many instances, are, are most difficult to measure. But from philanthropy's point of view, um, I think a lot will be forgiven around the relationship and the participative ex experience uh, uh, as well. Government is different because there are different, there are different masters in, involved and there are different issues in relation to public funding. But in, in the philanthropic space, the quality of the relationship is, is incredibly important. I, I'd also strongly encourage you to um, uh, propose uh, three-year programs, three-year funding arrangements. Um, I mean, I know it would be the default arrangement for you um, if you could possibly do that. But, but, but let me give you a tip. Philanthropic trusts don't want to be doing yearly programs. You know, the costs associated with actually the assessment round and the, the processes in considering uh, programs and projects that only one run for 12 months, that, that's, not, that's not cost effective. It's not good use of the time of executives. It's not good use of time of the board. I mean, it's a crazy state to be doing that. So um, philanthropic trusts have an, have an interest in multi-year programs. Your organisations have a, an interest in, in multi-year programs. You know, by force of character, <laughs> I would really encourage you to, to really talk about the, the virtue, um, uh, the virtuous cycle, in fact, of, uh, uh, of you having that conversation about forcing a longer-term horizon for the projects that you, uh, that you manage. And um, although it might be uncomfortable to do so, um, and recognising that each of you has something that the philanthropic trust wants, that is an adjacency you know, with, a, with a particular art form, a connection to the sector uh, that they're trying to support. It will take some courage, but try and stare them down around that point. Um, and to say that uh, if you're wanting to engage your organisation to fulfil one of their philanthropic objectives, then the basis upon which you do that is in a multi-year funding arrangement. Now, I, I know that might sound a bit anathema um, uh, given you know, where you would presume that the power lies in these relationships. Um, but I, I can assure you that the, that the sector has its own power to exercise over philanthropic trusts because they're looking for the great adjacencies, the great artists to work with, you know, the great organisations pursuing the great ideas. So, so you're, you're actually in a relationship around exactly that and you've got what they want around their projects and use that advantage whenever you can. On a multi-year issue, now in a weak economic climate, isn't it going to be a challenge for companies or foundations? Wouldn't they think one year rather than committing longer term? I, I guess this is where a distinction between sponsorship and philanthropy is actually relevant because um, within a philanthropic trust there is a corpus that's producing income and, and by and large they can make certain predictions around the level of income that they're going to have available for distributions and they, and they know what their income approximately is going to be like in one, two, three and four year time. The argument is that rather than go to the expense every 12 months of funding a new project, develop a multi-year relationship. Um, it involves making you know, really one decision, um, there's one assessment process, there's one form of engagement and of course every year you, you, you know, there'd need to be hurdles and there are the other KPIs that exist in any form of multi-year relationship but it doesn't require going back to basics. So it is actually a proposition uh, for both the philanthropic sector uh, and, uh, and corporates that uh, it's a far more cost-effective way of supporting the sector than having to come up with a brand new idea and a brand new relationship every, every 12 months. I suppose the things that I'd be thinking about is you know, what are the leverage opportunities here? In other words, what, what public funding might already be available to uh, support uh, such an activity? Um, the philanthropic sector loves leverage. Um, they love the idea that, uh, um, that, uh, that their support might in some way be matched by 
by government support and, and vice versa, it won't surprise you to know that the government funding likes to see that there are philanthropists involved. So knowing something of that relationship is important. A lot of funders, I think they look at the, the funding just purely for the programs, running the programs. They may not think of um, using part of the funding to cover administrative costs or manpower costs. So just wondering what is your view on that and, and also up foundations in Australia, do, do they look at some of the funding given to running an organisation and improving the competency of, of yeah. the organisation? Traditionally, um, the philanthropic sector is better known for project funding than it is for, for core funding of, uh, of, of organisations. And there are, there are exceptions, of course, but that's, that's generally the, um, um, the, the principle and, and practice. So, um, however, I think there is a recognition within the philanthropic sector that in order to pursue the sorts of projects that they might be interested in funding, that there is a, an organisation behind that with the capacity to deliver um, and um, uh, perform you know, what is necessary, necessary for that project to be a, a success. Um, so as, as, you, as you've just said, you know, building some core funding into a, into a project grant application um, uh, depending on the guidelines that each individual um, trust uh, and foundation, um, uh, the, the guidelines that, that they have, and, and subject to, to those, is, is obviously you know, a very sensible thing to, to do. Um, and the very nature of those um, capacity building projects um, is to give some support to the organisation to um, create some sustainability around their business models, uh, look at ways of ex expanding their, their supporter base, um, investing in systems that would make it easier for them to, um, to, to speak to a larger audience, um, uh, look at options like crowdfunding, um, other crowdsourcing models to support organisations and uh, uh, to have the um, financial capacity to develop some of those uh, 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 techniques. I think a lot of the rhetoric and discussion has been centred towards like high art and culture. So we talk about funding towards museums, theatre groups, festivals and so on and so forth. For ground initiatives and for grassroots organisations or people out there who just want to do something related to the arts but they are not sure whether or not they will succeed or I mean it might fail. So just now since you spoke a little bit more about capacity building then how do we ensure that um, local, I mean how do we ensure that grassroots uh, forms of art as well as like grant initiatives, how do we kind of like make them more visible and how do we kind of encourage capacity building within like the space as well? And I think the way that I to articulate that is that there is an entire cultural ecology um, that has to be supported uh, and if there's a weakness in the cultural ecology then that's a weakness that is going to be felt somewhere else. Um, if there isn't a small to medium sector that's being well resourced then in five years' time, the major companies are going to be suffering as a consequence of that. The museums and, and art galleries of today, um, if they're well resourced, um, unless there's a lifeblood uh, of new ideas and new inventiveness and new creativity um, in smaller organisations, then um, you know, down the track, um, the larger ones will, um, uh, will struggle. So there is a proposition and a case that I think needs to be, to be made around the whole of the ecology, that, that whilst it might be a particular uh, art form and it might be a particularly inventive um, uh, organisation, understanding context is actually really important in whatever philanthropic case that you, uh, that, uh, you make. Um, the related issue is actually advocacy, um, and advocacy by the sector, uh, by the broad sector, you know, by all parts of the ecology, uh, actually in support of each other. Um, so it won't surprise you, uh, I think, you know, to, to have you hear me say that, that in fact you know, the National Gallery has a role in advocacy around some of the smaller organisations as well because it knows that uh, you know, down the track it's going to rely upon you know, some of that energy um, and, professional, and professional skills for programmes that it's going to be wanting to operate. So there, there is a sense of mutual support uh, across art forms and, and across sizes of, of organisations. Um, um, so that, that's a significant part of, of, of it as well. And they'll come from the most surprising places. You know, there'll be, there'll be school teachers and, uh, um, uh, and school teachers will talk to their parents. Um, and parents, you know, might be in the professions and, you know, suddenly, you know, there are people with, 
some financial capacity perhaps who, who've heard about these things and, uh, um, and surprising things happen when you least expect it. Um, you know, someone might step forward and do something um, quite out of the ordinary. Um, and planning for those moments when, when, when they happen and having the story ready and being able to speak with conviction about you know, why it is that they might give some support to, to what it is that you're trying to do. How much energy should I then, you know, as a small arts company, you know, put into sponsorship? You know, because you, you, you know, it, it, it sounds like there are great opportunities out there, we're not fully leveraging them, uh, that, that, that there's potential to be unlocked, right? So, but again, if I'm a small company, how would I, how would I try and uh, focus? If you're a small to medium arts company, you're not going to land a sponsorship deal with Prada. Um, uh, it's just not going to happen. I know it might disappoint some of you, but it's not going to happen. Um, however, you know, there are a number of businesses uh, that are interested and engaged in creative culture, the life of the city, the life of the country, and what you're doing. Uh, and you have to sort of make the connections. Uh, and it's, uh, in many instances, it's, uh, it's, it's small sponsorship support from your suppliers, from your electricity companies, from your gas companies, from your stationary businesses, you know, from others from whom you're, you're uh, acquiring a product or uh, acquiring services. It's your auditors, it's your um, uh, other, others who are, are in a value chain connected directly to the organisations that you've, that you've created. Um, uh, you know, in, in, in my experience, creating a culture of giving requires a culture of asking. Um, in fact, a precondition for a culture of giving is a culture of asking. My tip is that benefaction, um, private benefaction, is probably going to be an easier ask in most cases. Um, and developing uh, a relationship with, uh, with some key individuals who, uh, who can support through their own private uh, benefaction rather than corporate sponsorship. However, um, there will be uh, private benefactors who prefer to support uh, the organisation through their business rather than account personal and I, I completely uh, acknowledge that so the, the lines do, do get a bit blurred. You've given us some good examples of what's a good culture of giving but maybe you can illustrate the opposite. <laughs> what's a bad culture of giving? Well, I think a bad culture of giving is, is one-year grants. We initiated a national indigenous art triennial. We landed a um, major Australian company uh, as the inaugural sponsor of that. Uh, and then they didn't renew their sponsorship for the second triennial. Uh, and you think, what on earth is that all about? Um, why might that have happened? And invariably, it's because there's been a personnel change, um, you know, the person that's there now you know, doesn't uh, want to be seen in, in the same guise as the person who they've succeeded in the role. Um, uh, he wants to, he or she wants to do something quite, quite different. But, but to me, that's an example of really bad corporate sponsorship. Earlier you mentioned about quality of relationship, right? So aside from reporting and recognition and ongoing engagements with the donors, um, because we would also need to calibrate our stewardship plans according to the size of gifts and the resources that we have. So, um, from perhaps we could share from your perspective with regards to the Maya Foundation, what's the level of engagement you expect and what the areas of focus do you think we should uh, look into in th with regards to our stewardship plans? I actually don't think there's a single answer to that question. And, and I think it, it actually goes right to the heart of what, the quality, of what the relationship actually is. I mean, you will know if you're dealing with people that are really engaged around a particular activity or a particular idea. Um, and candidly, for, and, and from the foundation's point of view, um, it, you, you try and find ways to keep that conversation alive. So if it's a, if it's a small community theatre organisation, you know, don't assume that the foundation or those connected with the foundation don't want to come and see the company in rehearsal. Um, I mean, assume that they might, that they might actually be interested in, in coming and seeing that. Don't assume it's always just about opening night or some other, other event. Um, no, don't assume that if it's, a, um, uh, if it's an artist-run initiative or a space where young artists are having their first exhibitions, no, don't assume 
that uh, foundations and trustees um, uh, wouldn't have any interest in going to visit the artists in their studios and seeing the, the work being created. Um, I mean, my, my counsel on that is, this is to create as many disruptions as you possibly can um, for those that are connected with the philanthropic decision. Um, and uh, imagine it as though it's a continuing conversation that you're, that you're having with them. Um, I, I can tell you, th they'll tell you very quickly if they think they're being, um, um, if, you, if you're becoming a, a nuisance by, by offering so many opportunities. But I, but I think um, my observation is that organisations, particularly small to medium, are, are very reticent or reluctant um, around uh, having those sorts of conversations, either for fear of rejection or because they fear that they, they might be just sort of taking the rela relationship too far. You know, my experience is exactly the opposite, that there aren't enough opportunities to really get a sense of what's happening within the community spaces and within the organisations that are being funded and supported. Um, so it all begins with a, with a conversation. The, the honouring benefaction bit, I think, is really interesting. There are some benefactors who don't want to be honoured at all. So the honouring is actually in the negative, but it's still honouring what, uh, what the benefactor wants. Um, you know, others you know, want it to be known th that their benefaction has supported that institution. Um, and um, being very clear-headed about how you're going to do that and, and what you're going to do and, and how that will be maintained over time. Um, uh, my counsel is don't offer anything in perpetuity. Uh, I mean, what on earth is perpetuity? Uh, buildings fall down. So, um, uh, you know, offer 10 years, um, uh, and if someone insists on 15, um, you know, reluctantly agree, but, but, don't, but don't, offer, don't offer perpetuity, um, uh, because, uh, you know, ultimately what that might mean is that the foundation will expect that you will maintain uh, something in the manner in which it was presented uh, right at the start of the funding relationship. And you, you simply can't do that. And if you've given up perpetuity, then you can't bring money in from any other source um, to, um, to do the work that's needed to maintain that facility in the, in the condition that it needs to be maintained in. I hope you agree with me that this has been a very rich, a very insightful session. I'm, I'm going to look at my notes and kind of recap some of my own kind of takeaways, which I'm sure you have your own as well, but I think it's also good for me to recap uh, what are some of uh, the things that hopefully arts companies and even NAC can take away uh, from today's uh, uh, round table in a square auditorium. Um, one, that it's important to have uh, long-term planning horizons. Long-term horizons, it, it's good for, for on both sides, both for the company as well as for the for the, the funders. Uh, it's important to develop a good, strong culture of asking. You need to have strong relations with the people who are supporting you. Um, and it's important to have strong boards. Hopefully the boards can walk the talk. You know, They can lead the way by supporting the organization financially. Um, even supporting su uh, smaller arts organizations is important because uh, they, help become, they help build up the talent pipeline for the larger organizations, which is one insight that I take away. Um, we need to think creatively about how to honour benefactors. Sometimes it can be thinking out of the box, can be even disruptive. Um, and and uh, these are these some of my, my broad takeaways. Uh, I'm sure you got your own as well. Uh, I, I'd like you at this point to join me to thank Mr. Meyer for a wonderful afternoon.